On Sunday night, May 3rd, 1868, Don Bosco resumed the narration of his dreams. I have another dream to tell you, a sort of aftermath of those I told you last Thursday and Friday, which totally exhausted me. As you know, on the night of April 17th, a frightful toad seemed bent on devouring me. When it finally vanished, a voice said to me, Why don't you tell them? I turned in that direction and saw distinguished persons standing by my bed. I asked, What should I tell my boys? What you have seen and heard in your last dreams and what you shall have revealed to you tomorrow night. Then he vanished. Don Bosco spent the whole next day in deep anxiety, knowing that he was in for a tough night. He put off sleep for as long as he could, instead doing work. He said, The mere thought of having more nightmares thoroughly scared me. However, with great effort, I finally went to bed. No sooner did he fall asleep when the same man in his previous dream appeared to him. When talking to his boys, Don Bosco would refer to this man as the man with the cap. Here, St. John Bosco continues. Get up and follow me, the man said. For heaven's sake, I protested. Leave me alone. I'm exhausted. I've been tormented by a toothache for several days and need rest. Besides, these nightmares have completely worn me out. The man only said, get up. You have no time to lose. Without further argument, John got up and followed him. He was led to a large, vast desert that led to a wide road. The road was beautiful and paved. The sides of the road were lined with flowers and hedges. After a smooth start on the beautiful road, John noticed that it began to slope downward. It sloped so much it was hard not to trip and fall. After a while, John noticed the boys from the oratory were also on the road, and many fell down the steep road. He said, I noticed one and then another fall to the ground and instantly be dragged by an unseen force toward a frightful drop, distantly visible, which sloped into a furnace. I asked my guide, what makes these boys fall? Take a closer look, he replied. Traps were everywhere. Some were close to the ground, others at eye level, but all well concealed. Unaware of their danger, many boys got caught and tripped. They would sprawl to the ground, legs in the air. Then, when they managed to get back on their feet, they would run headlong down the road toward the abyss. Some got trapped by the head, others by the neck, hand, arms, legs, or sides, and they were pulled down instantly. John asked, Why do so many get caught? Who pulls them down? Go nearer and you will see, the guide said. John went closer and picked up the trap and tugged. Feeling resistance, he pulled harder, but felt that instead of pulling something out, he was being pulled in. As he was dragged under, he found himself at the mouth of a dark cave. Continuing to pull the thread of the trap, he tugged and tugged until a huge, hideous monster emerged, clutching a rope to which all the traps were tied together. Running back to the guide, the guide said, Now you know who he is. I sure do, John said. It's the devil himself. On each of the traps, John saw that they bore an inscription of a specific sin. But the three biggest and most dangerous traps of all were impurity, disobedience, and pride. In fact, looking closer, John saw that the three traps were linked together. Next to these traps were knives and swords to cut oneself free. One sword had the word Holy Communion on it. The other sword said Blessed Virgin. Also near the traps was a hammer that said Confession and many other knives signifying devotion to St. Joseph, St. Aloysius, and other saints. Continuing with their journey, the road soon lost its beauty of roses and flowers and instead became rutted and full of rocks and boulders. With the road still sloping downwards, and now, full of holes and rocks, John fell often. He said to his guide, My good fellow, my legs won't carry me another step. I just can't go any further. However, the guide just kept on walking, so John had no choice but to follow. Finally, they reached the end of the road. They came to an enormous, foreboding building. St. John writes, I became smothered by a suffocating heat while a greasy, green-tinted smoke lit by flashes of scarlet flames, rose from behind those enormous walls, which loomed higher than the mountains. I realized that we were at the gates of hell. 
Suddenly, the guide pointed behind John and said, Look. I looked up in terror and saw in the distance someone racing down the path at an uncontrollable speed. I kept my eyes on him, trying to identify him, and as he got closer, I recognized him as one of my boys. His disheveled hair was partly standing upright on his head and partly tossed back by the wind. He wanted to stop but could not. Tripping on the protruding stones, he kept falling faster. Let's help him, let's stop him, I shouted. The guide would not allow this, saying, Don't you know how terrible God's vengeance is? Do you think he can restrain one who is fleeing from his just wrath? Meanwhile, the youth had turned his fiery gaze backward in an attempt to see if God's wrath were still pursuing him. The next moment, he fell tumbling to the bottom of the ravine and crashed against the bronze portal as though he could find no better refuge in his flight. Why was he looking backward in terror? I asked. Because God's wrath will pierce hell's gates to reach and torment him even in the midst of fire. As the boy crashed into the portal, it sprang open with a roar, and instantly, a thousand inner portals opened with a deafening clamor, as if struck by a body that had been propelled by an invisible, most violent, irresistible gale. As these bronze doors, one behind the other, though at a considerable distance from each other, remained momentarily open, I saw far into the distance something like furnace jaws spouting fiery balls the moment the youth hurled into it. As swiftly as they had opened, the portals then clanged shut again. I tried to jot down the name of that unfortunate lad, but the guide again restrained me. Wait, he said. Watch. Three other boys of ours, screaming in terror and with arms outstretched, were rolling down one behind the other like massive rocks. I recognized them as they too crashed against the portal. In that split second, it sprang open, and so did the other thousand. The three lads were sucked into that endless corridor amid a long-drawn, fading, internal echo, and then the portals clanged shut again. At intervals, many other lads came tumbling down after them. I saw one unlucky boy being pushed down the slope by an evil companion. Others fell singingly, or with others, arm in arm, or side by side. Each of them bore the name of his sin on his forehead. I kept calling to them as they hurtled down, but they did not hear me. Again, the portals would open thunderously and slam shut with a rumble, and then dead silence. We entered that narrow, horrible corridor and whizzed through it with lightning speed. Threatening inscriptions shone eerily all over the inner gateways. The guide said to St. John, From here on, no one may have a helpful companion, a comforting friend, a loving heart, a compassionate glance, or a benevolent word. All that is gone forever. Ahead of me, I could see something like an immense cave, which gradually disappeared into recesses sunk beyond into the bowels of the mountains. They were all ablaze, but theirs was not an earthly fire with leaping tongues of flames. The entire cave, walls, ceiling, floor, iron, stones, wood, and coal, everything was glowing white at temperatures of thousands of degrees. Yet the fire did not incinerate, did not consume. I simply cannot find the words to describe the cavern's horror. I was staring in bewilderment around me when a lad dashed out of the gate seemingly unaware of anything else. He emitted a most shrilling scream, like one who was about to fall into a cauldron of liquid bronze, and plummeted into the center of the cave. Instantly, he too became incandescent and perfectly motionless, while the echo of his dying wail lingered for an instant more. Terribly frightened, I stared at him for a while. He seemed to me one of my oratory boys. As I looked, another boy came hurtling down at breakneck speed. He too was from the oratory. He too emitted one single heart-rendering shriek that blended with the last echo of the scream that had come from the youth who had preceded him. Other boys kept hurtling in the same way in increasing numbers, all screaming the same way and then all becoming equally motionless and incandescent. I noticed that the first seemed to be frozen to the spot one hand and one foot raised into the air. The second boy seemed bent, almost doubled, to the floor. Others stood or hung in various other positions, 
balancing themselves on one foot or hand, sitting or lying on their backs or on their sides, standing or kneeling, hands clutching their hair. I then recalled what is written in the Bible to the effect that as one falls into hell, so he shall forever remain. Where the tree falls, there it shall lie. More frightened than ever, I asked my guide, when these boys come dashing into this cave, don't they know where they are going? They surely do. They have been warned a thousand times, but they still choose to rush into the fire because they do not detest sin and are loath to forsake it. Furthermore, they despise and reject God's merciful invitations to do penance. Thus provoked, divine justice harries them, hounds them, and goads them on so that they cannot halt until they reach this place. Oh, how miserable these unfortunate boys must feel in knowing that there is no longer any hope, I exclaimed. Just then, the entire ceiling of the cave became as transparent as crystal and revealed a patch of heaven and their radiant companions safe for all of eternity. The poor wretches, fuming and panting with envy, burned with rage because they had once ridiculed the just. How can these boys be damned, I asked. Last night they were still alive at the oratory. The boys you see here, he answered, are all dead to God's grace. Were they to die now or persist in their evil ways, they would be damned. But we are wasting time. Let's go on. He led me away and we went down through a corridor into a lower cavern. Here, one could see how atrocious was the remorse of those who had been pupils in our schools. What a torment was theirs to remember each unforgiven sin and its just punishments, the countless, even extraordinary means that they had to mend their ways, and their lack of response to the many favors promised and bestowed by the Virgin Mary. What a torture to think that they could have been saved so easily, yet now are irredeemably lost, the many good resolutions made and never kept. Hell is indeed paved with good intentions. In this lower cavern, I again saw those oratory boys who had fallen into the fiery furnace. Some are listening to me even right now. Others are former pupils or even strangers to me. I drew closer to them and noticed that they were all covered with worms and vermin which gnawed at their vitals, hearts, eyes, hands, legs, and entire bodies. Helpless and motionless, they were a prey to every kind of torment. Hoping I might be able to speak with them or hear something from them, I drew even closer, but no one spoke or even looked at me. I then asked my guide why, and he explained that the damned are totally deprived of freedom. Each must fully endure his own punishment, with absolutely no reprieve whatsoever. Next, they approached a cave. Inside this cave were many entrances to other caves with inscriptions of a specific sin. Over this particular entrance were the sins committed against purity. The guide said to St. John, Now do you want to see why our merciful God has brought you here? He lifted the curtain, and there St. John could see a group of boys from the oratory. Approaching another entrance where a curtain was hanging, it bore this inscription on it, Those who long to be rich fall a prey to temptation and to the snares of the devil. St. John said, this does not apply to my boys because they are as poor as I am. We are not rich and we do not want to be. We give it no thought. As the curtain was lifted, however, I saw a group of boys all known to me. They were in pain, like those I had seen before. Pointing to them, my guide remarked, As you can see, the inscription does apply to your boys. But how? I asked. Well, he said, some boys are so attached to material possessions that their love of God is lessened. Thus, they sin against charity, piety, and meekness. Even the mere desire of riches can corrupt the heart, especially if such a desire leads to injustice. Your boys are poor, but remember that greed and idleness are bad counselors. One of your boys committed substantial thefts in his native town, and though he could make restitution, he gives it not a thought. There are others who try to break into the pantry, those who rummage in their companions' trunks for food, money, or possessions, those who steal stationaries and books. After naming these boys and others as well, he continued, 
Some are here for having stolen clothes, linen, blankets, and coats from the oratory wardrobe in order to send them home to their families. Others for willful serious damage. Others yet for having not given back what they borrowed or having kept sums of money they were supposed to hand over to their superiors. Now that you know who these boys are, he concluded, admonish them. Tell them to curb all vain, harmful desires, to obey God's law, and to safeguard their reputation jealously, lest greed lead them to greater excesses and plunge them into sorrow, death, and damnation. I could not understand why such dreadful punishments should be meted out for infractions the boys thought so little of, but my guide shook me out of my thoughts by saying, Recall what you were told when you saw those spoiled grapes on the vine. With these words, he lifted another curtain, which hid many of our oratory boys, all of whom I recognized immediately. The inscription on the curtain read, The Root of All Evils. Do you know what this means? He asked me. What sin does that refer to? Pride? No, but I have always heard that pride is the root of all evil. It is, generally speaking, but specifically, do you know what led Adam and Eve to commit the first sin for which they were driven away from their earthly paradise? Disobedience? Exactly. Disobedience is the root of all evil. Listen carefully. The boys you see here are those who prepare such a tragic end for themselves by being disobedient. So-and-so, who you think went to bed, leaves a dormitory later in the night to roam about in the playground. And contrary to others, they stray into dangerous areas and up scaffolds, endangering even their lives. Others go to church, but ignoring recommendations, they misbehave instead of praying. They daydream or cause a disturbance. There are those who make themselves completely comfortable so as to doze off during church services, and those who only make believe they are going to church. Woe to those who neglect prayer. He who does not pray dooms himself to perdition. May I mention all these things to my boys? I asked. Yes, you may tell them whatever you remember. Is there anything else? Warn them against idleness. Because of idleness, David fell into sin. Tell them to keep busy at all times, because then the devil will not have a chance to tempt them. I bowed my head and promised. Faint with dismay, I could only mutter, Thanks for having been so good to me. Now please lead me out of here. He took my hand and held me up because I could hardly stand on my feet. Leaving that hall, in no time at all, we retraced our steps through that horrible courtyard in the long corridor. But as soon as we stepped across the last bronze portal, he turned to me and said, Now that you have seen what others suffer, you too must experience a touch of hell. No, I cried. Do not be afraid, he told me. Just try it. Touch this wall. I could not muster enough courage and try to get away, but he held me back. Try it, the guide insisted, and grabbed John's arm and pulled him to the wall. Just one touch, he commanded, so that you may say you have both seen and touched the walls of eternal suffering and that you may understand what the last wall must be like if the first is so unendurable. Look at this wall. John looked. It was incredibly thick. There are a thousand walls between this and the real fire of hell, the guide told him. A thousand walls encompass it, each a thousand measures thick and equally distant from the next one. Each measures is a thousand miles. This wall, therefore, is million and millions of miles from hell's real fire. It is just a remote rim of hell itself. So saying, he took John's hand and pressed it against the first of the thousand walls. St. John writes of this experience. The sensation was so utterly excruciating that I leaped back with a scream and found myself sitting up in my bed. My hand was stinging and I kept rubbing it to ease the pain. When I got up that morning, I noticed that it was swollen. Having my hand pressed against the wall, though only in a dream, felt so real that, later, the skin of my palm peeled off. Bear in mind that I have tried not to frighten you very much, and so I have not described these things in all their horror as I saw them and as they impressed me. We know that our Lord always portrayed hell in symbols because, had he described it as it really is, we would not have understood him. No mortal can comprehend these things. The Lord knows them, and he reveals them to whomever he wills.